Dave, we're really lucky to have you tearing you away from crypto crime fighting to talk about the other part of your job. Um, so um, I guess would you kick us off with um, talking, explaining a bit about the two basic parts of the SEC rule, the, uh, the uh, descriptions of the expertise of management that must be disclosed annually, as well as the materiality part. Sure, I'd be happy to, and thank you all. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with you today. So the SEC recently adopted, uh, it's not yet, I think, gone officially into effect, but recently adopted uh, what had been a proposed rule regarding cybersecurity disclosure by publicly traded companies and issuers. Um, in the original proposal, there had been a discussion about should we include a requirement that the company as part of their uh, disclosures reveal and talk about the expertise of the board or management or outside vendors to whom they are going to look to to provide the cybersecurity expertise on which they're going to rely in, in making sure they're properly disclosing risks uh, and also properly uh, positioning themselves to provide the types of robust disclosures that these uh, US securities laws require. Ultimately, the rule as adopted did not include that formal requirement, although I think there is an, an expectation in talking about how the company is preparing itself to uh, address cyber events, that that type of information, either it's they're going to rely on, on board members or they're going to rely on outside. I think there's an op opportunity for companies to talk about their particular expertise, why they're well positioned to satisfy these obligations. And in the way I think about it, that's actually even an opportunity for companies that are investing in that type of expertise and that type of skill to potentially differentiate themselves. I think it's an opportunity to talk robustly about if you are making this a priority, that's something that may separate you from, from competitors. It may be something that's important to investors. And so it's an opportunity, not so much a burden as an opportunity to kind of extol the uh, virtues of the work you've already been doing and plan to continue doing. Uh, the other issue is as to materiality. Uh, I think the guidance from 2018, the commission itself put out guidance in 2018 talking about cybersecurity disclosures and the obligations. I think the rule tracks that um, guidance pretty closely. Uh, the main change I think that has everyone's attention is now once a company has made a determination that event was material, and that can be quantitatively or qualitatively or both, there, that starts a four-day clock for disclosure. So previously, you were expected to disclose material events in a timely way, and now it is explicit that that, that window is, is four days, although there is uh, an exception available in the event of a national security concern where the U.S. Attorney General can contact the SEC and say, for national security reasons, uh, it's not appropriate to follow that four-day timeline. Easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> There you have it. I, I, would, I wouldn't pretend that, but uh, <laughs> hopefully clear. Uh, um, can, I, can I ask you to uh, kind of cast your mind back to 2018 and how, how did we get from that guidance to this more explicit um, rule? Were so, companies not being transparent enough? So I'm not on the rulemaking side, I'm on the enforcement side. And, sure. and I apologize, I should have led with this. Uh, please rewind your, your memories to this moment. Uh, I'm here in my professional capacity uh, with the SEC, but all the views that I express are my own and not necessarily reflective of the views of the staff, the commission, or fellow commissioners. So when you say it's an opportunity, that's your view? <laughs> so all of this is, is my view. That's certainly correct. So okay. <laughs> um, I think if you, because I'm not on the rulemaking side, I would, I would be hesitant to say why we've done this, but I think if you look at the number of publicly disclosed cybersecurity incidents that publicly traded companies have suffered, and then you look at the number of 8K disclosures that have been filed about those events, the disparity is clear. Many, many more events than 8Ks. And so I think while the guidance was clear about what the SEC's expectations were, it didn't necessarily prompt a dramatic change in behavior. And so I think this rule is an opportunity to say, for those, I think, minority of companies that may not have been appropriately disclosing in a timely way, mm. that this is really the explicit expectation and the requirement now under this rule. Okay, that's clear. Um, Rick, you've had such an interesting uh, mix of experiences and in being a, 
a securities lawyer as well as cybersecurity uh, law. So um, what, what are the risks, um, if you could describe them, but all, um, for a company, but also for a CISO in being transparent about cyber risk? Yeah, so when we're, when we're talking about this, we're talking, we're speaking two different languages, which is really a significant part of the problem. The security team, uh, the cybersecurity team, uh, will look at events differently. They, they really, especially if we're talking about an incident, looking at the forensics, what can be observed or not, um, that doesn't translate directly to securities disclosure which is looking at materiality for the whole company. And materiality may not be what somebody thinks it is. If, if there's something that happens that has a huge reputational risk and it would move the stock, that may be material, even though the incident might not seem material to the cyber team. So, and, and you can have it, it exactly the opposite. So the, the information security people, the CISOs, they're very worried because there have been some uh, things that have happened out there. There, there was a guy named Joe Sullivan who uh, was prosecuted uh, based on some disclosure, which- The former CISO former, or chief security officer of Uber. Yeah, yes, thank you. And, uh, and then there's a Wells notice so for an enforcement action uh, against Solar Winds, that also uh, has the the CISO named there. We don't know exactly what that one is, um, but David will tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you want to talk about it, David? No, perhaps not surprisingly, I'm not in a position to discuss not yeah, public investigations. <laughs> <laughs> so, I so. One on, on the Joe Sullivan side, if you read it, don't lie to federal regulators. I mean, just don't, don't, don't do that. It's a good tip, um, good yeah. tip. Sorry? It is a good tip. Yeah, it, it, that, is, that is a good tip. Don't, don't lie to federal <laughs> regulators. <laughs> okay, it will go badly for you. Um, Take one thing away. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, the, the Wells notice, we don't know. I, I suspect that it has something to do with disclosure controls and failure of information to get from the team that was investigating, which by the way, I believe did a fantastic job in investigating and addressing that once, once that happened, but uh, to the disclosure team, right? So it wasn't a failure in the cyber, in the CISO, in terms of operating as a CISO, I suspect, I suspect that it has to do with disclosure controls and information getting out publicly in an 8K. So that's the, the takeaway from this is you have to have appropriate disclosure controls. And Kurt, disclosure, the name of the game. What are you doing to prepare? Um, there's a couple of different things. So we're, we're, we have a disclosure framework um, and it's co-developed between my team, the comms team, the legal team, the finance team, and it does just what you're describing. It's a, it's, think of it as like a translation document. How do you get from server 001 has been you know, deployed, a, mal a malware has been deployed from this specific threat group to Look, it was only 200 records of a, per, you know, of, of, of we call them travelers, consumers, but we feel as though this is the public disclosure of this is material enough that it would impact our stock, and so we're 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 standardizing the way that we're having that conversation. The second thing that we're doing, um, tabletop exercises cannot say it enough. Um, so we we have some tabletop exercises we're doing to test out the new rule and how we would perform um, in the flurry of a media blitz plus still disclosing the 8K. How does that sound to you, Dave? So we are principles-based and not uh, proscriptive in terms of what specific steps any particular entity should be undertaking in order to be 
compliant with their specific obligations. We set out in broad strokes what those obligations are and then leave it to companies to come up with their own approach. Mm -hmm. So I'm reluctant to weigh in on anybody's particular plan, but I think the idea of coming up with plans in advance, testing the efficacy of those plans, um, being mindful of how you think about materiality, um, both in terms of quantitative and qualitative, I think all of those are the sorts of process that I think will lead to better results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brian, you do a lot of work with boards. Yep. How are directors interpreting the current situation? I think that they're, they're viewing it as a um, necessary advancement, right? They've known that something needed to be codified and specified more than it's been in the past. And I think there were a, a bit of a sigh of relief that they didn't have to disclose their own resumes and their own bios about cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I think they were happy with that. Um, and I think that they're looking forward to doing exactly what you described, having a more predictable set of processes so they know what's coming, what are the sequence of events that will occur when we have an incident, at what threshold does it become material. Now, I think that they're, they're struggling a little bit right now, especially given you know, December's uh, staring us in the face with how are they going to know what's material. And it's uh, nearly impossible to predefine that but they're starting to begin to be more serious about uh, level of exposure in terms of dollars or brand or um, potential litigation, those kinds of things, which historically it, we work with a variety of sizes of clients at, with, with their boards and the sophisticated high-end boards, they have a predefined set of methodologies, the red, yellow, green, it's this many records or it's that many dollars and so on. Uh, but it's the mid-market that I think is now starting to be forced into, oh, we got to catch up. Mm -hmm. So. Their viewing is a, a necessary step, but I think there's a little bit of an, oh my goodness, we're not quite ready. And yeah. can I add, I think there's there's two things that causes like some confusion around this topic. The first is it harkens back to when we're all kids. We're in the kitchen, we're playing, we hit a glass off the counter, it falls. The parent comes in there, David, and says, <laughs> <laughs> and says what'd you do? And it's like, nothing, right? So, so, the first is, I think too many times folks in an effort to downplay a particular incident might be like, yeah, something happened, but nothing to see here, everything's fine. And then there starts to be discrepancies from 8K to 8K, depending on how long the incident is ongoing, which my, David's antenna might go up and be like, something's not something in here. Um, so, so that's the first. And then I think the second is, it's okay to have a default position to try to, to disclose but you don't have to have all the answers right away, right? So um, I think if you, if, you, if you read the rule, it says uh, four days from the time you've determined its material. Now don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying take a month to figure out whether or not something is material, but if you need to take a week earnestly, in earnest, honestly, to figure out whether or not something is, is material, I would venture to say that, <laughs> you do this very well. that that you take the week to give good solid information because remember this document is used by the SEC of course David's team other parts of the SEC your shareholders um, a lot of people depend on this document so you want a don't downplay it and b take the time you need uh, to provide the right level and uh, fidelity of information that people can make decisions with. Yeah, and I, I so. The problem that we've got is that it, in the initial stages of, of discovering a significant incident and attack, uh, what, what, I, look, what I always tell my clients is everything that you think that you know is wrong. It's just wrong. Um, parts of it may be right, mm -hmm. right? I, yep. I'm getting lots of nods here. So parts of it may be right, but there's a ton of confusion. The problem that we're going to run into is if, because some things we're going to know that they're material, right? If you have a ransomware, your systems are down, it's material. I don't know how you can take too much time. Why it happened and what's going to, like, what's going to happen after that, you don't know. You don't know if they're in your systems, if you've gotten them out. I mean, there, there are all kinds of issues with that. So the issues are going to come with what's said in that disclosure. Because if you say something and it turns out to be wrong, then 
you run the risk of enforcement or lawsuits on that, you have to be very careful in how you're crafting those statements. And this is what the securities lawyers do. But the securities lawyers don't understand what the CISOs are talking about. And they don't understand what the people who are doing the forensics are saying. So their need, the disclosure controls have to be a way to translate that stuff very quickly, very, very quickly. Brian, you're nodding. Is that what you're encountering? I, it is. And, you know, I think what you were saying in the beginning, I would simplify to you can't unring a bell once you ring it, right? So just be cautious and careful and make sure what you put out is, is correct. Um, and I, I think what we're looking for also, for, again, putting myself in the position of the board, is transparency and uh, continuous communication so that they can be in a position to make the best choice. Because no two situations will be the same. Some will be blunt acts obvious that it's material and it needs to go out. Some will be not so sure. And I think what I'm seeing in most of my directors now is they want to engage, they want to understand, they want to be educated, but they, they're not very keen on admitting that they don't understand, right? So tabletops, working sessions, briefings on a monthly basis, whatever it is that fits your culture, your situation, I think you're going to continue to see the directors be leaning in more and looking for more of that collaboration, more spending time with the CISOs and getting that kind of coaching. Because we are seeing two totally different sets of language, two different perspectives. And again, if you step back to the board's position, they're looking out for the, the shareholder, right? And they're looking out for understanding all risks. In this case, it's cyber, but it could also be currency risk. It could be geopolitical risk. It could be competitive disadvantage due to technology, those kinds of things. Hundred things they have to worry about, and this one they don't really do very well, and because it's it's matured, it's become a, an issue so quickly. You know, in the scheme of things, like currency risks have been around for hundreds of years, right? Technology elimination has been happening. They're, they've got muscles built for those, but this one they're still learning. So I think this this transparency and publishing the eight K and disclosing ten Ks is going to help accelerate that maturation. Go ahead, David. And, and I would just add that I don't think that there is an expectation on the part of regulators that anyone's going to have perfect visibility and a perfect explanation for what occurred and right. it, the potential consequences of it within four days. I think that it is contemplated that it is an iterative process where the company should go out and explain that it was a material event, talk some about the potential consequences of that. But if later... Um, in good faith, they develop additional information that either contradicts what they thought they knew before or adds significant color to what they previously told their investors. There's an opportunity and even potentially an expectation that there will be a, a further disclosure to bring the investors into the, the tent as to what has happened and what the potential impact that may have for their investing decisions. So I think the idea that you have to have perfect knowledge day four is probably uh, I could understand why that would be scary. I don't think that's the expectation. And I think the discipline that uh, cybersecurity professionals already engage in, in terms of logging events and tracking those events and being able to explain those sequence to others, I think there's an opportunity in crafting those disclosures to record what is known at the time. So that if later a regulator comes in and says, on this day you said this, two weeks later you said that, you have some place where you can say, when we made our initial disclosure, these were the facts that we had and this was the basis of it. And so that you can keep a record so that we can see that the communications that were being made were based on the best available evidence, they were reasonable, they were within the, the bounds of expected conduct or expected uh, behavior. Yeah, the, you know? the, I just push back a little bit because what you, what you find in, a, in an investigation like this, and I've been through some really nasty ones, um, you have information, you might actually have the information early about what happened, but the investigators go through these investigatory steps. They look at all the possibilities to basically take out ones that, that aren't right. But you may actually have some logs somewhere that show something, and, but you don't know what they mean yet. But the information's there. Looking back on it later, you'll say, oh yeah, we have this information. It was there at this time. So the company knows it, theoretically, but they can't interpret that yet. And that, that's where this, the backward look on that kind of thing is, could be very, very problematic for companies. But I think it's an and and not an or, because both of you are correct, and that's why it goes back to that 8K. 
So if like data set A has been compromised, your first 8K might say, we have reason to believe that data set A has been compromised, the method of which and whether or not this has been exfiltrated and the degree to which the data has been exfiltrated is still unknown at this time. We will issue a further update as the information becomes clearer, right? And that captures both of those where you're making a responsible disclosure, but then you're not making assumptions and you're not oversharing nor are you withholding. Yeah, and, and the importance of clear communication and documentation. I won't go so far as to say CYA, but I will say it's important. CYA. You know, if you have 100 <laughs> terabytes of logs, haven't investigated those because I just found out about this six hours ago, right? right? Then you can document, you can communicate with what you do know and what you have had a chance to assimilate and analyze. And, but it, it won't stop the naysayers and the Monday morning quarterbackers in two years looking back. How but could you they can not defend know? with what you reasonably know at that point, right? From an operator perspective, not a lawyer, don't play one on yeah. TV. Well, and, you have, and, an and you're right, this, the CYA, but the better that you are documenting what that investigatory process is, yeah. what determinations have been made based on that, um, that, that will help you. And having those disclosure controls so that when you really do see some evidence of likely, because the SEC has added likely to this, likely exfiltration, so it likely has a material effect, um, that that information gets to the disclosure team that quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what you've been describing, Kurt. And, and that's, that's the key. I see this, and especially in the middle market, as where that falls down. Mm -hmm. they, don't, yeah. they, they don't have these things built up. And that muscle memory yet. If I could add one thing that I think you're hitting on, it's really, really important, is a lot of the CISOs um, are interpreting this as, okay, this is my football to run with. And that's not really true. So don't put the pressure on yourself if you're a CISO or in the CISOs team to be the sole determiner of what's material. That's not realistic. It's not expected. Uh, there is a risk team, and there needs to be a risk team. If there's not one, you need to find a partner. Mm -hmm. um, and you need to be tied in with them so that they can see in the broader context, the bigger picture, what is the risk that's material or not. You're a SME, you're a source, you're a key member of that team, but you're not necessarily the quarterback of that team. So don't put that pressure on yourself. And, and or maybe the, the more cynical way to look at that is don't allow yourself to be under the bus like some of the CISOs we talked about here who didn't communicate clearly and effectively and found themselves on the wrong end of things. Right. Yep. So let's dig into materiality and the uh, quantifiable and the qualitative and quantifying the qualitative. Um, Kurt, what, are, what steps are you taking to get your arms around that? The quantitative is pretty easy, right? I have fair, <laughs> um, you know, so I have a team, and where's Krishna? Is he in the crowd? Krishna, throw your hands up. Where are you? He must have slept any party last night. Mm -hmm. So Krishna, Krishna my, um, as a member of my team, he won the um, Champions Award last night. For those of you that, was, that were here, I wasn't. I was on dad duty. Um, so there's, there's fear that we rely on quite a bit from the quantitative. And I, and I actually believe the biggest challenge of this is the qualitative side of things because it's really tricky to figure out how to your point um you cannot ring a bell it's really tricky to figure out how the market would respond and therefore is it material right because we've seen some breaches where i've seen two breaches almost the same not terribly large but not terribly small either and in one case it's kind of like ah it's fine and in another, it's like catastrophic for the, pub, the reputation of that company. So I think a lot of this comes down to the qualitative side of things. So we're trying to put a little bit of structure around that as well. Um, what is a, I like the term likely impact if this information were to become public and if it is likely to hit a particular threshold, then let's classify that as material and share. It's better to, in that sense, again, delicate balance, your stock price for the publicly traded companies are, is at risk of, of dipping a bit. But in this case, I, think, I, I always favor responsible disclosure and it's better to take that risk than to not share. Because none of us, if you look at it from the other direction, would you want like, information that can determine whether or not you invest your life savings 
into something to be withheld from you. No, you need every possible piece of information afforded to you so you can make a responsible decision. Is that satisfactory, Dave? So I'm not. <laughs> Why is right David? Not, not, <laughs> I, I can define the theory. Tell us more, David. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah. Because every company is different, and because we are principles based, I'm not in a position to be able to provide the kind of guidance that I'm sure you all wish I could provide or, or would provide. Um, but I do think thinking about materiality deeply, thinking about qualitative as uh, both apart from and maybe in, in correlation with quantitative is, is the right approach to be taking. I think that erring on the side, if it's close call, it's in, erring on the side of disclosure um, may be helpful in terms of when a regulator later looks at what came out, uh, the public reporting on the breach and, and the way that the company responded to it. And my hope is that by companies more frequently filing 8Ks and the fact of breaches becoming something that is routinely reported, that it becomes less stigmatized, it becomes less significant in the minds of investors, not that it will never impact stock price, but that hopefully if this is just one and another stream of incidents that everybody is potentially vulnerable to, there's less individual entity uh, impact from any individual uh, cyber event disclosure. Rick, what are you telling your clients about um, assessing, determining materiality? What kind of factors go into it? I mean, FAIR, um, this conference is, is full of people talking about quantitative stuff, and the FAIR MAM formulas and models are playing a big role. Yeah, and, and the quantitative side can definitely be helpful, helpful, not determinative in materiality determination. I, I, I can give examples of uh, significant cyber event. I, I got asked by a company that makes some, let, let's say, plates. Uh, they get them made in China. They, you know, if they had uh, a ransomware, if they were taken offline for 30 days, they would go to paper. If their vendor got taken offline, their factory got taken offline, they've got five others. They got hit with a cyber incident, wouldn't be material for the company. They would just go back to pay, they wouldn't, they're, it just wouldn't, right? And then I can also think of if, you know, the CEO or somebody senior is being investigated, there's a failure of a cyber control, a threat actor gets the, those papers on the investigation, right? That would be material for the stock. That would be material. And it would be a failure of a cyber control, so you would have to disclose that as a material incident, even though it might not be seen as a material failure from the cyber standpoint. So you, you have to take a look at the qualitative. It can't just be quantitative. But when you're hit with a significant incident that affects certain databases and you know that those are likely to have these longer term effects on the company, the qualitative can inform that significantly. And that's the larger majority of things that, that come up like this. So the qualitative, but then the, the, sorry, the quantitative, but then the qualitative has to look at what's the mix of information out there, what are the, the likely impacts on the company and the stock. And those are things that the information security team isn't involved with. I mean, they don't really, that's not what they do. That's not what they're hired for. They, they can help to inform that, but that's not what they should be doing in terms of performance of their jobs. But isn't that where a committee comes in, you know, to discuss these things from everyone's expert point of view? Yeah, they, so there's usually a disclosure committee or there's a disclosure team uh, they will be talking to the board, informing the board, help those decisions all get made. Usually there's a securities lawyer involved, not a cybersecurity lawyer. They're, they're, they're very specific in, in what they do. Uh, the CFO is involved, the CEO is involved, um, and then you may have others depending on what exactly, you know, what business line it was, um, other things like that. The information security officer 
is going to be informing about what happened, what's known, what's not known, all of that in the middle of defending this, this thing. So mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of all of that confusion, probably not having had a lot of sleep. So that team that's looking at it, I, I advise companies to have people who are cross-trained, uh, who a, a lawyer who's cross-trained on information security and securities disclosure, and a technical person to sit in on all of the incident meetings, hear what's going on, and translate that stuff up so that the uh, that the team can be thinking about that, looking at it, maybe ask the CISO some questions, but not pull the CISO out of what they're doing. So new disclosure controls. That's what the SEC is really looking for in the end, to have appropriate disclosure controls. You don't have to get everything right. They're not looking for you to get everything right. They're, you may make judgment calls. You're allowed to do that. You may have to update them when you find new information. But you have to have the right dis the controls in place to make sure that the disclosure is informed. So I, I have a question for David, pulling an audible here, Ken, and well, for the panel. So let's say uh, this might be an interesting insight into when something is material on the qualitative side, even when it's not on the quantitative side. So let's say, for example, there's an industry that's super hot. I mean, people are in, throwing tons of money in there. It's on this insane trajectory. And for the first time within that industry, let's pretend, that there was this catastrophic breach of this one company in the industry. I mean, just all hell is broken loose. Um, and it took a while for this company to get back on its feet and so on and so forth. And now investors are kind of like, it's still hot, but my, I'm, I'm a little bit, my temperament has changed a little bit. I'm, I'm cautious. Then there's now this second company in the same industry that had a breach that's nowhere near as catastrophic or material. As a matter of fact, for that company, it is not material at all. Let's say they're both publicly traded companies. Um, while ordinarily you wouldn't disclose that as material, I think, a, and, and let me know your thoughts, an example of where qualitative comes in is that since I'm part of this industry which is heavily invested in, uh, there's a ton of public money here, um, do I still need to disclose this because of the broader context of the industry and the, and the breach that happened six months ago? Uh, I'm gonna give the perfect lawyer answer, maybe. <laughs> um, I feel like I wasted that a really no, good no. scenario uh, there. Let, let me let me let me just yeah. give a, let me give a little bit more. Yeah, we'll, 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 we'll. So, uh, one of the things with securities disclosure is if you start to talk about something, you have to continue to talk about. It. Um, so, would you be required to talk about it if it is not material? And would you be required to file an 8K? if you feel that it is not material, but you know that the stock price may be affected because people's perceptions are wrong. Not necessarily. You might put out a press release saying this happened, mm. it's not right. And that does not necessarily need to necessarily be included in AK. But you might choose to do an AK because it is actually, it, it will affect your price, the stock price. So there's a judgment involved in that. And I think that gray space is where like a lot of companies are kind of like, how do we handle this? Well, but that's securities, securities lawyers, securities, not security, yeah, securities. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is what they do, right? Because it, it could be currency risk, right? I mean, it, it could have been that. It could be many other things that affect hot industry and they're they're making these judgment calls all the time and this is just another area where that judgment call gets made and they're not perfect and sometimes they'll have a lawsuit against them as a result of either saying something or not saying something so that discretion that type of act, you know decision making it's part of the normal process mm -hmm. of being a public company. And, but in a situation like that, David, Kim, I'm so sorry. In a situation like that, I'm assuming you're coming in and you're saying, 
with the information that if it's well documented, with the information you had at that time, it could have been 50-50. Any reasonable person, you could have or you, you could have chosen not to. And in that situation, is it fair to say it's less did you or didn't you and more with the information would a reasonable person have made a similar decision? So I, I think uh, Rick is right to look to the approach the entity takes about disclosures more generally. So taking it out of the cyber realm specifically and just say, is this the type of information that we think our investors care about in the same way that they ask themselves that question, the people on the disclosure committee or the people responsible for making ultimate determinations about what is going to be formally disclosed as an 8K, they should analogize this consideration to the other types of materiality determinations they have to make all the time and try and say, is this important to investors? Is this sort of information that's going to alter the ultimate mix of, of information out there? Is it something that we have previously spoken about and that potentially created an obligation to continue speaking about because absent some additional information, what had been uh, appropriate level of disclosure is now omitting information that would be material to investors. So without being able to give you more specific, but I, I also agree with Rick that process is incredibly important and in being able to document that process. If you take a responsible approach, if you can show that you were being, uh, devoting resources to it, taking it seriously, making your best estimates, we don't anticipate anyone's going to be perfect. We know we deal with humans, we're humans ourselves. So. Uh, it is more about showing that you had a um, intentional approach to how you were going to try and make those determinations necessarily than the, the ultimate determination itself. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. Does a responsible approach, I mean, this is for any of you to uh, think about, but does a responsible approach in this context mean um, documenting a process and discussions, um, or does it mean adding data to the conversation or using uh, a model or a formula? So if you have that data, you need to use it. If the company has the data that an attack is likely to have this impact or, or a failure of certain control is likely to have this impact on the company, you need to use that in order to inform that qualitative decision. If you don't have that data and you're making that qualitative decision, you will be wrong more often than if you do have that data. So that, that type of data is actually really, really important to inform that decision. It, it, it is, it's great, as if you're playing securities lawyer, it's great when that information comes in because then you have something to point at in that process of making the determination, right? You've got some hot, solid numbers. Either way, either that it will or won't be material. And it may turn out that it's wrong in the end, but that's a really important way that you can document that you have uh, been reasonable in the judgment that you made. I um, I'm a uh, is Omar in the room? Where's Omar? Here he is. Um, Omar, I had coffee one time, and he told me something that was super interesting, um, which was it was and it was way back when I had my one of my first uh, CISO gig, and he was like, you know, what you want to do is, and I hope I get this right, Omar is you want to take like your, the drawer that has all your, you know, pot spoons and all the random things and random knives that well, if you stick your hand in there too carelessly, it'll cut you. And you want to turn that drawer into like your silverware drawer, where it's like, the, you know, the spoons go here and the forks go here. And what he was saying was that like process, process is really important. That stuck with me, by the way. Um, and so I'm, I'm a sticker for that. In my mind, to answer your question, Kim, if I were to go through something now and I get a phone call and I got to hop off this stage and run out and we were faced with, God forbid, a, a, some type of catastrophic cyber incident, I would probably, um, and this is going to be overly tactical, but on, on purpose, I would probably spin up whether it's a Confluence page or uh, a SharePoint because in my mind, I know the teams work in the incident, but what I'm thinking about is should David come and be like, hey, Kurt, good to see you again. 
Um, I need to be able to demonstrate to him that, to your point, data, that I had this data and it was in this meeting that we reviewed it and this decision was made. So a decision log based on what data and so on, because my biggest hurdle, um, and, and it's not just hurdle, I'm not, I'm not just trying to get past the SEC, but if, if I want to make good, smart decisions, I need to embed it into some type of process. And if I, if I throw that up and I'm able to walk through that, making sure that everyone sees the same information, we're documenting the decisions, we're documenting the risks based on those decisions and so on, then it makes us better, helps us respond better, and kind of slows us down a beat to make sure we're not making decisions that just shooting, you know, shooting from the hip. But then also anyone, any reasonable person can come behind me, including our, our securities lawyers, and take a look at this and be like, I have come to the same conclusion. The only thing I would add to that is in that document, you might want to consider overlaying your process for making those disclosure determinations. So say we've got 15 steps, here's, we've gotten through step five. Here's now we're gonna to go to step six so that you can show that not only do you have a process, but you're running that process. Mm -hmm. You know, the processes to us are always, uh, they give you the ability to have muscle memory. So you might have a dad day when something happens. Yeah. You know, you're in Honolulu or something, right? Who knows? I wish. Um, so that the organization <laughs> has the ability to, to proceed uh, and in a predictable fashion, using predictable processes and, and documentation methods, those kinds of things. Uh, that's that's always vital. Yeah. And having, whether it's Confluence or whatever you use, having some system of record for that as the home base every time, not, so you don't have to rely on you know one time, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand it up this time. That's vital. Yeah, yeah, because when people start getting under stress and, and getting bombarded every 37, 37 seconds with a question status update, right? Where are we, where are we? They, they need some kind of ability to execute and take some of the motion out of it. And also, if, if, you, codif if you codify that within your organization, it's a forcing function. Because you can imagine, right, as, well, for executives, everyone has a super strong personality and everyone is as nice as we might seem and are really like intense and like our drivers. And so it's a forcing function for the organization where if the CEO or CFO is like, well, do this, well, no, nope, hold, hold on a second. This is our policy. We're gonna walk through these 15 steps. We're gonna document it here and we aren't ready for step six yet because we're missing A, B, C, D. So it also helps to kind of, like I said, slow down the organi our organization a beat and put a little bit more structure around decision-making. Yeah. We're getting some really good questions from the audience and we have a few minutes for those now, but keep them coming. And not surprisingly, um, some of these questions center on what really is the role of the CISO, the responsibility, the liability, and also um, this could be a career enhancing opportunity for some CISOs. Um, so uh, Mosey Platt um, asks, if the CISO will be accountable for breaches professionally and perhaps legally, then how should organizations manage the incentives to ensure the CISO has the right size amount of input and influence on decisions of materiality? I mean, that's the essence of uh, what CISOs are worried about right now. Yeah. yeah. We get asked that a lot. Uh, and one of the things that I would suggest is that the predicate of that question is that we are, the accountability has somehow changed. And I think that's one of the things we probably should take out of the system. There's nothing about the new rulemaking that creates new liability, new obligation on the part of the CISO. If anything, I, I interpret it as taking away some of that risk and liability because as I mentioned before, the CISO can't own and be accountable for all elements of an incident. By definition, we're having to shift and be very clear, where is GC and are they aligned? Where is the risk team, are they aligned? And clarifying those roles actually is, is taking pressure off of CISOs that historically has been very informal. I don't know, it's a CISOs problem, right? And I think this is forcing us to mature and, and get very clear on those roles. So I would interpret it the other way. Um, and then we also have questions about CISOs, should they take roles in these organizations that if now they're going to be declared publicly in a 10K that our SME is the CISO, then should they be part of DNO insurance? And many cases we're saying, yeah, the O is often, it does not include the CISO. 
and there's no carve out of liability. So I think it's wise to be thinking about inclusion in DNO, especially if you're taking a new role, uh, make that a term of employment. Uh, so we're seeing progressively more of that day to day. I would say, so generally I agree, there's one caveat I would make, but, but the reason I agree is because I think this caveat is a reflection on an individual CISO's uh, professional capability and integrity. And that is, if the CISO has not historically been telling the truth in board meetings or being transparent about gaps in cyber controls, this absolutely does introduce more risk for you um, if you're a CISO. But ideally, most CISOs are not doing that. It's always tough to tell the truth, but you should. Um, that's the one thing. The second is, I would say that if you're searching for a new CISO gig, or even now, if you're part of a company, absolutely go talk about DNO insurance. And it's funny, I got CISO friends, and they're they're so in like they're I think it's their disposition. It's so interesting. One, his whole view is, pay me a lot of money, I will come in and be your CISO because I know if something goes wrong. I need to jump in front of the bullet and fall gracefully, and that that sort of protects the company, and the company can be like, oh yeah, no, he failed but we got a new CISO that's going to do great. And then he can just kind of lick his wounds with his, you know, $10 million parachute package and go chill for a, a year or two. <laughs> and then you got other CISOs who, who are like really, and that's not to say that he isn't passionate, but there are other CISOs that are really like, like mission driven, right? And they're like, I am here to make the world a better place and that's what I'm going to do. Um, so I think... It, in general, I do, I do agree that in this scenario, it shares the risk, except if you have deficiencies in your integrity or professionalism. And I do think um, as part of, and because it's so shaky right now, as part of like managing that risk, as an individual who's taking a CISO gig, you definitely want to make sure that DNO insurance covers you absolutely, right? Um, you know, in the Joe Sullivan case, for example, I think even before he went to trial, you know, fees were up in the millions and easily for any, and for any, I'm sure it's the same for Tim at SolarWinds, those fees mount quickly. And if you don't have that DNO insurance, you are broke for a long time, mm -hmm. so. Well, company yeah. may still have to in, indemnify you under their, under the bylaws. So that's right. The DNO insurance doesn't, isn't the only it's factor not silver, in Correct, it's, it's, it's not a it silver bullet, but it is important, but yeah. It, so just one quick thing, the, what we're talking about Regulators have been pushing for CISOs to have more authority. New York Department of Financial Services, um, you know, is leading that. But but a lot of the regulations are requiring CISOs to have more authority within the organization. On the other hand, I had a, a friend who does uh, audits for the SEC of financial institutions said that if they come in and uh, ask about information security and they get sent over to the tech guy, they get mad. So the company has to, this is a company effort. It can't just be on the CISO. Yeah. That, it, it can't be. Right. And if it is, yeah. things will go wrong. Um, and so it needs to be an organizational effort with the CISO providing the right information and leadership. Yep, agreed. Let me just jump in. We have about seven minutes left and I wanna get to some more questions. Um, James Fraser asks uh, an interesting question about disinformation. How do we address disinformation attacks where an attacker threatens to have some amount of data stolen from you or can do something that has not um, supplied real proof that they have this data or are in your system? So um, to Kurt's point, it can take weeks to figure out if this is an actual material threat. And that's becoming much more common. So how do you think of that scenario in this context? I would, um, yeah, so I would say if, if, if the information that your security team has corroborates that claim, then you want to assume it's true. Um, so that's sort of right of boom, boom meaning the incident, right? If you can corroborate it. Left of that, really, you spend a lot of time trying to deploy some cyber controls, whether it's encryption and so on and so forth. So both of those are necessary because even if 
information corroborates that there's been some exfiltration of data, but all of your golden nuggets or critical data is encrypted, then it becomes a moot point. Okay. Um, another question. Uh, FAIR Institute, this is about the FAIR, MAM, um, common taxonomy. Um, common definitions are, are really important. Again, get that consensus and um, a level playing field in these discussions. So how do you think that can help all the stakeholders making these decisions get on the same page when you're assess assessing the possible impacts of a cyber attack? I would, I'd offer this thought. Um, when we start getting into how do you manage a business, you know, the, the, the world runs on numbers and companies run on numbers and it's uh, dollars or it's market or it's numbers of employees, those kinds of things. So anything that we can do to standardize the language with which we, we think about risk and how we decompose it and have a standard lexicon so we can communicate meaning the same thing when we use the same terms. And then further, getting to the point where we're quantifying risk for cyber, just like we're quantifying the probability of if we enter this new market, we'll need to spend $10 million. Is there a guarantee that I will get a return of that 10 million plus some X percent of profit? No, it's probability, right? Same thing with uh, if you're going to drill a new oil well, if in the oil business, what's the probability I'm going to hit? Better here, worse there. Yeah, they quantify that. They don't use words. They, they work in numbers. So anything that we do to advance this discipline, to be speaking more in terms of probabilistic estimates using common vernacular, I think will do nothing but drive us to quicker decisions and quicker alignment. So, yeah. Another question. Um, if there is no requirement to disclose uh, cybersecurity expertise on the board level, um, I'm interpreting the question a little bit here, would it not be a liability for a company to declare a certain level of expertise and then have to deal with blowback if they have a breach. You mean if they overstate the board skills? Is that what Maybe, or they just say, you know, X has X years of cybersecurity mm. experience. Mm. I'm dying to see how this comes out, right? I'm glad you guys did this, right? It's going to force a lot of hands. There's been a lot of bluffing going on for years, right? <laughs> so you have people on the board. No, you got to go on the record. Right, because right? I said you got to go on the record. Exactly. Your 10K needs to explain your governance, yeah. including the board composition of cyber expertise. So yeah. I think it'll it'll sort of... Well, they took they took out the that you have to discuss the board expertise. You have to right. discuss management expertise, right. but you don't have to discuss the board. And what the SEC said when they did the release of the rule was they said that they don't require expertise for a variety of different areas, so they're not requiring the expertise there. Nevertheless, if you're going to describe how you govern the board cybersecurity, how the board is, is governing for, for that portion of it, either the board has to have the expertise in order to govern, or they have to hire the expertise in order to govern. Right. So you're going to have to describe it anyway. Right. So Even while that's not a resume. Right, yeah. right. So it doesn't have to be on a resume. You don't have to have the. But people, I think, took way more from that change yeah. than is real. What do you mean, say more? People thought, oh, well, they got rid of the requirement for yeah. the board to have the expertise, so now it's just letting the boards off. Right? Yeah. Like, like that, that not, not I don't think case. it's changing anything. Yeah. I, I just... Which is, why, which is why I said, like, to me it's a requirement because you would be hard-pressed as a publicly traded company to describe governance and your cybersecurity governance and not have to opine on the structure of your board, even if the requirement isn't there. Right. The board members individually don't have to have that expertise, but they need to have some it mechanism. available to them, yep. specifically to them. Either as a director or as an outside influence, so that they have sufficient expertise to oversee at a reasonable level. The exactly. In, yeah. in a way that can be described in, in the 10K, in annual securities disclosure. Right. Not that's just now public. ad hoc. Yeah. yeah. This is going to be fascinating. Fascinating <laughs> for the, the nerds in the room, right? It'll be fascinating Q1, right? I think uh, there's a, still a lot of angst until the SEC makes an example of someone, David, so balls in your court. That's not fun of mine when I wake up each morning, but I appreciate the opportunity, I guess. Uh, and I, and I <laughs> to make an example of someone. <laughs> uh, and I should point out that in the the 
enforcement actions following breaches that the SEC has brought, and certainly the three most recent ones, there have not been any individuals named in either the uh, settlement documents or as a defendant in any of those matters. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but I don't know that anything in the rule adoption has changed other than uh, full stop. I think there is um, a priority to hold individuals accountable if they are um, deceiving the government. I think that's, right. you know, should not do that. If they are in other ways, um, the decision makers in a way that is outside of uh, what could be described as the reasonable approach that cybersecurity professionals typically take in making assessments of what has occurred and in sharing that information internally. But I think the SEC recognizes that the decision of when to disclose and what to disclose is a whole of entity process that isn't just on the cybersecurity uh, frontline operators, the CISO, it's on the entity as a whole, and that that's why the disclosure controls procedures are so important to us, because that creates the process through which everybody knows what's happening. If you look at some of the actions we've taken, a problem occurs when the people in the cybersecurity realm know the facts, and somehow that information doesn't flow to the people who are making the disclosures. So if you're able to solve that and make that line of communication open, that got you a lot of the way to where you need to be, I think. That's a good place to end it. Thank you all. You're right. wow. mm.